Hello, I'm Roger Woods, a preaching minister for the Walled Lake Church of Christ, located in Oakland County, Michigan, not too far from Detroit. I'm glad you joined me today for this video version of the sermon for Sunday, August 28th, 2022. This will be the last series uh, on worship that we have been covering all this month here in August. Due to the holiday coming up, I will not be recording next week, but I invite you to join our new study that is going to begin September 11th, and this new series will be based on the letters to the church in Thessalonica. In these letters, Paul focuses on many issues that we still have great interest in today, uh, issues like the second coming of Christ and how do we live godly lives. I hope that you'll be able to join me in those lessons as well. And remember, if you have questions, please feel free to email or call. And also, I want to remember, remind you that you can always tune in through our uh, website, uh, walledlakecoc.org, and catch our live recording of the streamed service. Uh, if you want to watch it live, you can turn it on at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, and there will be uh, 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, U.S., so if uh, you want to join in with us, I hope you can continue doing that. Uh, I also you know, want to encourage us to come in person if you're in the area. Uh, we'd love to see you. Uh, yes, there's still con some concerns with the pandemic, and, uh, but it's getting safer. It's time to get back to church, get back to worshiping together, and what a blessing that is. And we're going to talk about that today. Now, as we begin the lesson itself, I want to uh, read from two passages of Scripture, and I encourage you to, in a moment, pause the video and turn to these passages. Uh, one would be Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, and the other is Psalm 63. So, Deuteronomy 6, Psalm 63. As we begin, I will begin with Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. I'll be reading verses 1 through 9. These are the commands and decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them. On your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And our second reading is from Psalm 63, verses 1 through 5. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. One Sunday morning, uh, preacher McGee noticed that little Alex was standing up at a large plaque that hang in the foyer of the church. And the seven-year-old had been staring at it for some time. So, McGee walked up and stood beside the boy and said quietly, Good morning, Alex. And he turned and looked at the preacher and said, Good morning, preacher. But then he looked back at the plaque. He said, Preacher McGee, what is this? Well, son, McGee answered, These are all the people 
who died in the service. Soberly, they stood together, staring at that large plaque. Little Alex's voice, barely breaking the silence, asked quietly, which one, the nine or the 1030 service? Ah, yeah. Safety. Safety is something we are worried about in our world. We want to be safe. We want to know that we are not in peril of any sort. And of course, everywhere we look, especially thanks to the media, uh, it just seems like peril is everywhere. There's potential for a mass shooting or disaster or accident anywhere we looked. And, and the question becomes, for many, how can I stay safe? We're overcome with fear. So I wanted to give you some examples of maybe some things we can do to stay safe in the world and see if we're willing to do them. You know, the number one thing you can do to stay safe in the world is to avoid riding in automobiles. Yep, they are responsible for 20% of all fatal accidents in the world. Okay, get that? Stay away from your car. Fat chance, right? Okay. How about this one? Do not stay home <laughs> because 17% of all accidents occur in the home. Hmm, even the home, our castle is not safe. Oh, and by the way, avoid walking down streets or sidewalks because 14% of all accidents occur to pedestrians. So we can't ride in our car, we can't sit at home, and we can't even walk out on the street. Hmm, too dangerous. Oh, and avoid air travel, rail, or water, because 16% of all accidents involve those forms of transportation. And of the 33% remaining, 32% of all deaths occur in hospitals. So above all else, avoid hospitals. Oh, but you're going to be pleased to know. You will be pleased to know that 0.001% of all deaths occur in worship services in church. Yeah, that's right. And these are usually related to previous physical disorders. Therefore, logic tells us the safest place for you to be on any given time is in church. And by the way, Bible study is safe too. The percentage of deaths during Bible study is even lower than it is for worship. For safety's sake, people, attend church. Read your Bible. It could save your life, but, but better than saving your life. It will save your soul. Jesus asked a question in Matthew 16, verse 26, that I think we need to be asking. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for a soul. What is a soul worth? For that matter, too many in today's society, or for too many in today's society, the question is even more basic, since the knowledge of spiritual things is so lacking. What will a person give in exchange for their soul? Surprisingly little, especially if they don't know the value of the thing that they're trading. And that's just how Satan likes it. He likes to see us distracted and not know the value of the thing that we hold right in our hand. The Shema, uh, which is part of the reading that came out of Deuteronomy this morning, uh, that I just read, is it's so wonderful. And, and it implies a three-part division to the person. Uh, loving the Lord with all of your heart soul, and strength. Uh, it refers to the emotional, that's the heart, the spiritual, that's the soul, and the physical, that's our strength, parts uh, of that make us complete individuals. And when one of these areas is out of balance, we're just not right. Um, we ourselves, well, we become imbalanced. You know, and like that unbalanced load in the washing machine during the spin cycle, you know, how that happens. Boom, 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 boom. Well, life gets bumpy for us when we're out of kilter. 
you know, King David expresses this sense of imbalance in Psalm 42, verses 1 through 5. It's believed that this psalm is written while David was on the run from King Saul. Being driven away from Jerusalem by his pursuers, David just longs to be back at the temple, back in the worship services with the people of God, praising God together. He writes in Psalm 42, 1 through 5, As a deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with him? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. Why was David so down in the dumps? It was because he couldn't go to worship. David's inability to worship God with the assembled congregation in the services of the temple threw off his equilibrium. And for David, that evoked massive grief at what he had lost. I believe David would agree with Eugene Peterson, who wrote that worship does not satisfy our hunger for God, it whets our appetite. If we walk away from worship satisfied, something's not right. If we think we have met God at worship, we've only met a little bit of him, and there's more to be had. Hungering and thirsting for God is where we need to be. But we're only going to be there if we're in worship. Hebrews 10.25, the writer encourages the saints to hold fast to the truth, They were being tempted to return back to the old law and to give up on Christ as their means of salvation and justification before God. Uh, To give them strength, the writer exhorts them to not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but to encourage one another and do it all the more as you see the day approaching. And of course, that day is the day when our Lord will return and bring all mankind to judgment. Worship is for our spiritual side, what a facelift is for our physical side. It takes what life has roughed and beat up and puts it back where it belongs. Uh, It is a place where we can regain our balance. Unfortunately, we have a tendency to lose perspective and ascribe importance to the wrong areas of our life. Leland Riken, a professor at Wheaton College, describes this flaw in this way. Earlier this century, someone claimed that we work at our play and play at our work. Today, the confusion has deepened. We worship our work, we work at our play, and we play at our worship. Those are convicting words. But let's not think that because we are physically present at worship makes our worship acceptable and beneficial. Sometimes we're just playing at our worship instead of really taking it seriously. And if we are playing at our worship, we are not giving all our soul. We must be fully engaged emotionally, the heart, We must give him all of our hearts as we worship him. We must set aside the distractions that would otherwise take our attention away from God. So, is your your cell phone silenced? Is it turned off? As you have gathered for this time of worship, are you fully devoting your thoughts to this? We need to give it all our heart and all our soul. You know, David uses imagery of hunger and thirst to describe the condition our soul needs to be in as we come to worship. You know, an appetite that we noted a moment ago is intensified 
in worship, our, our appetite for God, that sense of needing God like a starving man needs food and water. Uh, our, our scripture reading this morning from Psalm 63, verses 1 through 5, David wrote this while he was hiding in the desert. Uh, he, he draws the analogy not that not only his body craves nourishment, and it did, but his soul was wasting away. And I think that hurt him even more. So why is worship so important to the soul? Well, it's important because not only does it keep us in balance, it also revives us. Psalm 19 verse 7 declares that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And brothers and sisters, oh, I don't know about you, but I need reviving. I need reviving on a daily basis, not just a weekly the mess I would be in if I didn't have this time of reviving, this time of gathering together with my brothers and sisters in Christ and sharing the hope we have in Christ. You know, the world will throw us down to the mat and pin us if it were not for times of refreshing. That's why it's so vital for each of us to attend worship if we can. And if we can't, let's do the next best thing. Not because it meets every single one of your wants, but because it is essential to your spiritual life. It is like breathing in and breathing out. It's that essential. If you cease to breathe, you cease to live. If you cease to breathe spiritually, you will die spiritually. Air is important. It is so important. In 1988, the world watched in rapt anticipation and, and, and concern as three gray whales were icebound off Point Barrow in Alaska. There they floated, battered and bloodied and gasping for breath at a hole in the ice. Their only hope was to somehow be transported five miles past the ice pack to the open sea. Well, the rescuers began cutting a string of breathing holes about 20 yards apart in the six inch thick ice. For eight days, they coaxed the whales from one hole to the next, mile after slow mile, all the way along the way, excuse me, one of the trio of whales vanished and was presumed to be dead. But finally, with the help of a Russian icebreaker, the whales Putu and Siktu, or Siku, uh, swam to freedom. What a inspiring story. I still remember it. But it really illustrates what worship is for us. It is air. And it is vital for our survival. <laughs> worship is like a, a, a string of breathing holes that the Lord has provided for his people. We, we come to them battered and bruised in a world frozen over with greed, selfishness, and hatred. We rise for air in church. It's a place to breathe again, to be loved, to be encouraged until that day when the Lord shatters the ice cap. This is holy time. Giving the Lord all of our soul is essential because worship, the worship of those with divided loyalties, it's not an acceptable worship to our Lord. Now I'm thankful the Lord is gracious and merciful and forgiving because none of us are perfect in this but it's what we need to be striving for. To have that undivided heart and soul focused on our Lord and worship. David wrote in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Who He who has clean hands and a pure heart and does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what? is false. Mm. 
so glad for God's grace. We'd all be sunk. So glad for the cleansing blood of Christ who makes us blameless before the Lord. But we can lose that covering if we do not seek him like a starving man seeks food, like a man dying of thirst seeks water. If we are only giving the Lord lip service and worship, and instead are, are worshiping our work or our status or our tribe or our physical appearance or our race or anything other else than God, then we, in effect, are giving our soul to an idol. If we are holding back from the Lord all our heart and all our soul, then we are also holding back the blessings that God wants to give us in worship. So don't despair if you're struggling. Um, you're in the company of fellow strugglers. But that's why we're here. This is one of those holes in the ice where we can come up for air. Yeah, we got to keep going. We're going to have to go back down under the ice cap. And we're going to have to swim and get battered and beat up by the world. But there's another hole. Worship next week. There's even other smaller holes. Worship with our fellow brothers and sisters. Bible study. Times to get a quick breath of air as we go through our daily life. These blessings are ours, but only if we stay steadfast will we be blessed. David Hansen writes about the blessings to be found in worship this way. He writes, when I was eight years old, doctors diagnosed my youngest sister with a life-threatening neuromuscular disease. Not long after this, my father began weeping in church every Sunday. Now, he didn't cry out loud. He didn't buckle down with his face in his hands. His tear glands flowed, and his voice cracked as we sang hymns. I never asked him why he was crying. I didn't know what he was thinking. I still don't. But something important happened inside him during worship. This went on for several years and tapered off. My sister is now a wife, a mother, and a special education teacher. In 1989, he writes, my wife developed chronic fatigue syndrome. In three weeks, her life changed from being a graduate student and an adjunct professor to being plowed in bed with a low-grade fever, severe short-term memory loss, and barely enough energy to take a shower. Still, somehow, most Sundays, she made it to church. And during worship, she sat and wept, same way my father had some 30 years before. I figured the same thing was happening inside her that was happening inside my father. The Spirit was praying from within. Unutterable changes were occurring. Why go to worship? Why give all your heart and all your soul, all your mind, all your strength to the Lord? Well, because there's healing to be found there from the ravages of sin and the hurt of sorrow and the suffering, and the hurt of sorrow and suffering. And this healing can only be found in God and more specifically in the worship assembly. As together we offer up our lives as living sacrifices to praise him. And as together we take a deep breath and get ourselves ready to face the world and to be Christ's ambassadors in this world so that we can offer hope to others who, like we are, are struggling to breathe. Psalm 84, verse 2. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out to the living God. Where are you this morning? Or this afternoon or this evening, whenever you're watching this video? Do you have a void in your life that you've been unable to fill? Friend, don't look anywhere 
but to the Lord. No one and no thing will satisfy or truly provide you what you're lacking, that empty place inside. Instead, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him there is full redemption. Psalm 30, verse 7. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the, the gift that you have given to us of the assembly worship, assembled worship of your people. To be able to come together as a community of faith and affirm our common beliefs, our core beliefs. To bring to that assembly our hurts and our sorrows, our failures and our victories. To come together and, and together to lift up your Son and breathe in the fresh air of the Spirit as we together give praise, honor, and glory to you. Thank you, Father, that we are blessed to have this time. Father, help us to seek it out always, to not take a vacation, to truly give ourselves wholly to you in every way so that our life is a living sacrifice of worship to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you are seeking to be able to breathe, God has the breath of life ready to breathe into you through his spirit, which is available to all through Christ our Lord and Savior. If you would like to learn how to be blessed with this gift, I encourage you to call me. I encourage you to email me, contact me, so that we can study together about the hope that I have and that I hope you can have in Christ. You have a blessed day.